Hello and welcome to Backstage, uh, my first guest I've known for over 13 years. Uh, I first met this guy in uh, 2007 and he was the media manager at the time uh, for one of the World Pro Cycling Tour teams, CSC. Met him at the Tour de France and my first impressions were he's a hard nut to crack. Uh, we first referred to him as Mini Me because he worked with uh, Bjarni Rees and uh, they looked very similar but uh, he had a bit of a, a swagger about him but very good at his job. Uh, and then over the years, uh, Brian went from being a media manager to actually general manager. And he ran at the Leopard Trek team in 2011 uh, that almost rolled Cadell Evans at the Tour de France. They came agonizingly close, finished second, Cadell won. Good for the Aussies, but not good for Brian. Uh, and then Brian came across and I worked with him at Green Edge Cycling Team. He was my boss, essentially. Uh, I was homeless for 2012. We lived together, didn't end up so good. Uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and then in 2016, Brian uh, left uh, the Green Edge team, left media management, became a broadcaster. He started a cycling brand. And we'll talk about what's happened, particularly in the last six weeks, because I don't think you could cram any more into six weeks or a six-month period than Brian has. Brian, welcome to Backstage, mate. Cheers, mate. And thank you for the introduction. That was... Uh... Yeah, some stuff has actually happened in the since we met the first time. I guess I, uh, I'd like to think that I'm less of a stern person now than when you met me in 2007. <laughs> no, you've definitely uh, I've seen another side to you. Uh, except as I mentioned earlier, we we did try and live together in 2012, and it lasted about three days. Uh, yeah. I believe the the story is, and and this is the fact: you kicked me out because I urinated with the door open. Yeah, that didn't go down well. <laughs> I was I was living in a in a house out in the countryside in Tuscany at the time. And there was definitely room enough and there was more than one toilet. But uh, and I guess we just didn't agree about the acoustics. No. Uh, now, Brian, now that you're not affiliated with any cycling team or, or a broadcast, I can ask you straight questions and you get straight answers. With everything that's going on in the world with corona, uh, is cycling, as we know it, completely screwed? I mean, it's, it's professional sports in general. You know, if we if we look at what else is going on in the world, we we probably shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves because it's a luxury to have professional sports in our lives, and it's it's not something that you know um, is a matter of life and death. Even if it feels like that when you're in the middle of it, <clears throat> cycling is taking a very hard hit now because all the big races are cancelled, and right now we're sitting in the period where you know, back when you and I worked together, we were very close to the classic period. We'd probably be more or less in between. Uh, Milano San Remo and the Tour of Flanders. So getting close to, for me at least, one of the best parts of the year and then the Giro uh, after that. So And right now, none of that is going to happen. So cycling fans, bike riders, teams, broadcasters, everyone probably uh, has a feeling that cycling is is pretty much screwed at the moment at least. But like you, like you said initially, so many things are right now in the world and it's a luxury probably to, to be able to even be missing cycling right now. So obviously, from a team's perspective, uh, they don't generate a lot of money uh, compared to other sports. You use uh, soccer, for example, or football, as they say over in Europe. Uh, you've got revenue streams coming in from memberships, merchandise, uh, TV rights, all these sort of avenues, whereas cycling, they don't have any of that. You know, They rely purely on sponsors. If you don't have a product out on the road, I mean... The model seemed flawed even before all of this happened. So how on earth have they got a chance with uh, not being able to give any value for sponsors at the moment? Yeah, that's a tough one at the moment. You're right. I mean, it's not, they, they, weren't, they aren't making any less money right now. They're just not pr uh, producing any commercial value because there never was a stadium. There were, never was an entry fee. Uh, there were a few other sources of income for professional bike teams. And so I guess that they're making the same amount of money. And now it's just a question of patience, I suppose, from, from the people who pay for it and, and all the commercial activities, all the media access, all the fan, fan based enthusiasm is, is shut down at the moment because there aren't any races. Uh, if, I guess soccer or, or some of the other stadium sports are, are even worse off because and not alone do they miss out on major TV rights um, at the moment, but they also know in, um, income from selling tickets or selling merchandise. But cycling uh, is for the moment completely shut down. Obviously, teams that, Brian, they generate 80% of their revenue from the Tour de France alone. Uh, and there's a lot of, it seems like there's mixed messages with from the financial side and what the medical 
institutions are saying. They're, they're saying, bunker down, this could be nine to 12 months. Until we get a vaccine, until we can knock this thing on the head, um, it's not going away anytime soon. So even the chat about um, holding this cycling world tour off or holding the Tour de France off a couple of months, I mean, they've delayed the Olympics. Um, it seems like the, the real case scenario is there won't be any riding uh, this year at all, which is obviously a disaster. That is definitely a disaster. There are a lot of disasters going on in the world right now, especially in the country that I moved away from, which was Italy. But it's hard to really, it's hard to predict. I, I find it very hard to imagine like a pseudo version of the tour without any spectators and and let alone thinking about the safety for the riders because they'll definitely not be able to keep the, the distance you'd have to keep. And, and it's hard to imagine that any type of race would, would come out of it that would even resemble something that we would that we would like to see and then i guess there would be a lot of people watching it because there's not much else to do because most people will still be stuck inside i just think there's an irony and, and a sad irony to just the idea of seeing bike riders riding on on empty roads and 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 putting on a, a type of a race and i would salute them for their bravery but i'm just not sure in, in the bigger scheme of things whether we actually need that right now and whether it would be promoting anything that that's worth uh, saving or, or, or looking at I mean we we all want to see cycling survive this you know, tough period but there's a lot of other parts of society that need to survive this as well and like I said initially it's a luxury to to even think about the where cycling is right now a lot of bike riders have parents have grandparents we all we all somehow a stakeholder in this crisis so thinking that cycling must survive or the tour this is what we're talking about must survive at all costs and then running a pseudo race I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure whether they actually understand how serious this is so say there is no racing um what would you um estimate the amount of teams that would essentially collapse and then if that does happen um does this present almost a fresh start for the sport because they've always talked about you've got this problem with these um, organisations all fighting against each other. You've got ASO that own the Tour, you've got RCS that owns the Milan San Remo and some of the classics, you've got the Flanders group. Does it almost present an opportunity to, to create a structure like F1 and just have it all under the one banner and create almost a brand new structure across World Tour? Well, it's hard to see anything solid to be built on the ashes if this is going to turn into a massive burn pile of, of teams uh, on the financial meltdown. The, the sad thing is, I guess, and that was the case even before the virus, is that cycling at any given point will always be a reflection on the financial reality uh, of, sponsor, of sponsorship revenue. And I'm worried and I'm pretty sure that we'll see teams folding because of this. We'll also see a lot of sponsors fold because of this and those two things are obviously intrinsically tied together. I just find it hard to to really think that something good will be built out of this because cycling's biggest problem, at least until recently, uh, was that there wasn't a real sort of superpower and the only financial or or, or long-term superpower was the tour. And that's also why they're fighting so hard to, to keep the sport alive. I'm not even sure that, that um, we'll see... Yeah, I would at least say 20% of the World Tour teams could could disappear be, because of this. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that, and that's a relatively recent thing, at least uh, in, when you talk about big money, a lot of the teams are sponsored by cycling brands. And cycling brands, they have to use professional cycling teams to promote what they want to promote, especially the ones who sell high-end race bikes. They're not going to go away. It could be that there could potentially be more of those, and the average uh, price tag on the sponsorship would be, I think, potentially a lot lower, even if you wanted to to run a World Tour team. Brian, uh, we said at the top of the show, uh, you probably couldn't cram any more into your life in the last six months particularly. Do you want to take us through what's happened since you left uh, Oracle Green at the end of 2016 and, and where you are now and, and what the current situation is? Yeah, I guess it's pro it would probably be faster for me to say what hasn't happened. I uh, After I stopped working for professional teams and and I was very happy that I was able to do that for almost six years with my, you know, with my Australian friends. I worked for three years as a, a cycling commentator, and I did probably around 900 hours of, of broadcast in those three years. And uh, I'd always thought I would do something else than than cycling, uh, and I always wanted to uh, work with maybe another even as big passion uh, as cycling is in my life, and and that was wine. And actually, 
yeah, probably even before I was offered the job at Green Edge, I had a possibility to work in California, but I felt at the time I didn't, uh, I wasn't really ready. Then the the job came up again, and and I'm actually sitting now in in California, uh, chasing another live stream, which is uh, running a winery, and uh, but that's not really the the biggest headline for me. I am also now a, a father. Uh, my, my wife gave birth to uh, to two twin girls just before Christmas. Uh, sadly, they're not uh, with me here. They're stuck in uh, Denmark uh, because of this whole situation. They were supposed to move out here to join me uh, next week. Uh, they'll come eventually, <laughs> I'm sure. But right now, we just don't know when. So, yeah, I'm sitting in, uh, in Northern California right now. So six weeks ago, you get married. You're about to start this new journey. And you say to your wife, okay, well, I'll see you over in California soon. Uh, say goodbye to your, your twins. And then you get to America, and then was it pretty much instantaneous? Hang on, I'm on. I'm, I'm about to embark in a real shitstorm here. This Corona thing is getting out of control. What happened in particularly in the last six weeks when you came over to Cali? Well, you know, we moved from Italy, uh, my wife and I, and, and she moved to Denmark uh, just a few days after I left for California. The reason I went here first uh, was to set everything up to get us enrolled in the healthcare system to get everything in place, paperwork, and, and get the house started. I, when you, As you know, you also have two uh, small children. You want to get everything in place before you, uh, before you start a new life, and that was my part of the job. So I came and I did that, and very shortly after that, the problem that a lot of people thought was isolated to what was going on in Italy became a, a global pandemic, and everything has been a bit of a meltdown. And, and yeah, then a few weeks later, uh, a travel ban was uh, introduced, and, and everything was... Moving, uh, yeah, it was basically impossible to really for them to come over, and it would also it was also very hard for me to come back to Europe, uh, let alone uh, trying to avoid being in quarantine. So it wouldn't really make much sense for me to even try and go back. And and uh, I'm not sure if we could cram any more people into the my in-laws' uh, house in Denmark. So right now I'm just waiting for them to to be able to travel and waiting for this, as we all are, you know, waiting for this situation to to become a little bit more tangible and, and for life to return to as much of a, a normal state as it could possibly be after this. So what's the feeling like on the ground in California? Because we get obviously fed over here in Australia, you know, all Trump sound bites. And the most recent one was, you know, this is not going to be a long-term shutdown. That's not how America works. We're talking, you know, could be weeks. We're, we're back up and producing stuff again. Um, what is the feeling like in Cali and, and particularly, you know, things coming out of Trump's mouth? Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm personally uh, very concerned about the entire situation, uh, definitely also here in the States. Uh, selfishly, I'm very happy to be in Northern California and, and far away, more or less alone on a, on a 300-acre ranch, you know. Then, uh, I'm looking at it at how the approach is in California, and I find that to be a lot more forward and a lot more inspired by how it's been tackled certain places in Europe. Uh, I'm, I'm dreading for what's going to happen in New York, and I'm definitely also dreading for what's going to happen in some of the states where they weren't that fast as, as they actually were in, in, in California. Uh, Trump said, and, and that's his catchphrase at the moment, isn't it, that he said that the cure can't be more dangerous than, than the illness and the disease. So he's been uh, toying with the idea, and I really hope that he keeps it with toying with the idea of opening up uh, around Easter, which is two weeks from now. And, and when you see the numbers that are coming out, uh, America is now the, the hardest hit country and, and the numbers are, are multiplying uh, as we speak. I highly doubt that they that he can do that, even if he did. They incentivized two trillion dollars of of financial help across the the federal continent and across the, the states. But I'm not sure that that the money is is really going to be the solution to all of this. Uh, America has only just seen the the tip of the iceberg. I think. Now, one of the myths, I suppose, to come out here is we're seeing also a vision of a lot of Americans just stockpiling weapons. Uh, are you concerned that? given the lack of sort of gun control over there, that they're almost preparing for the apocalypse? I certainly hope not. I mean, I have a relatively liberally minded, uh, democratic, I would say, orientated friends. A lot has happened over here, uh, I think, after Hurricane Katrina, and a lot of people got scared if, if there were to be like a natural disaster or, or sort of the the social harmony would, would see another meltdown. So I, I think a lot of people have weapons and a lot of people that you and I wouldn't even think would uh, be carrying firearms. Um, 
I, I've, I've seen those same stories and I've seen also that people are stockpiling, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm currently not a gun owner and I, I highly doubt that I'll be one myself, even if I was considering when I heard we had a black bear on the, on the ranch that comes to visit once in a while, but, you know, I'm, I'm quietly hoping he'd be more scared of me than I would be of him, which, yeah, I guess I, have, I would have my doubts, but uh, yeah, I'm, it's a strange situation to be honest, mate, and, and it's nice to be joking about it, but I also worry about bringing into um, you know my two small newborn girls and and my wife and you know she uh, she obviously married an older man uh, and <laughs> and and put her faith in into my decisions and my judgment but this was just not something you could plan it for you know and uh, how has it affected your industry um, obviously things like exports would, would be hard hit but how do you sort of then tackle um, this whole corona disaster well, we're a- <clears throat> relatively small family owned winery and, and our business is you can sort of the, roughly divide it up into we we grow grapes and sell them to to other wine companies like coppola and and other big producers and then with a small amount of the of the grapes we grow we make wine of ourselves and our, our market is almost entirely domestic uh it's obvious that wholesale is, is going to take a hit because restaurants have been at a standstill or, 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 and it will be for quite a while. People don't dine out that much uh, because the restaurants are closed. And our direct-to-consumer uh, market, which is you know wine that we sell directly to to people like you and I, has, has actually been really good as of recent week. We've been, we've been promoting uh, – I'm not trying to sell wine to you right now, but we've been promoting yeah. free shipping as – as one of the first wineries here in Sonoma, where I am, and that's kind of helped because people like to have stuff delivered to the door, and they don't want necessarily to go and pick it up themselves. And what's the website, Brian? Where can, where can we go <laughs> if you're in America? Yeah, it's it's called Stuhlmüller Vineyards, and as as hard as it is to pronounce, there's a German ancestry here. Actually, a lot of wineries in, in Northern California. But anyone, you can go and have a look at my Twitter profile. You can probably see where where it is I'm working. I'm I, uh, I hope, and I, uh, I hope people in general are able to, you know, find some kind of consolation in, in opening an ice bottle at home or, or cold beer. And if you if you're an Australian, well, I think uh, a lot a lot more alcohol is going to be consumed, particularly in the current climate. I know I've been uh, tipping them back. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I'm very happy that I'm, I'm I'm not going to run dry on on access to to wine anytime soon. They can keep this uh, going on for a while. Now, uh, you've obviously uh, lived in Italy for a big chunk of your life. Um, they're going through absolute hell at the moment. Um, are you still in contact with a lot of people back there? And what is the, obviously, dire situation at the moment? Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It, it's, it really is heartbreaking. I, uh, the last, uh, I, I moved since you first uh, uh, did your, your, your song and dance show in my <laughs> toilet. And I moved to a small village close to the, to the Mediterranean and... Uh, I'm still, I still have a home there, and I'm still in contact with, with people that I call my 86-year-old neighbor, uh, Miss Falcone, once a week, uh, just to check in on her because she's, uh, she's stuck, obviously, inside, and her, her family is in Milano, and they can't, they can't go and see her, let alone help her. So I, I call her once a week, and she's, she's doing great. She said to me the other day, you know, I survived the Second World War. This is not gonna, this is not gonna affect me at all, but. It is definitely affecting Italy, and, and even at a community level. I'm every every night I tune into to the yeah similar podcast as we do, I guess a video podcast that the mayor in my little town does, and and hearing him go through the numbers and hearing him even yesterday, and it, and it is a very very small village that two people sadly had uh, had died because of this. It it affects everyone, and Italy has a very old population, and as you probably remember also when you we, you had a lot of Italian colleagues as well. When you and I work together, they they're very close to their grandparents. They're very close to their parents, and often they live three generations under the same roof. And it could be one of the reasons why this has been spreading so aggressively. Um, now you're obviously well read. You're a big fan of the New York Times. Uh, now a lot of people are saying, "Oh, well, it's a, it's an old um, virus. If you're old, you'll you'll get it and you'll be in trouble." But um, you know, young people should be fine. Um, that's not the case. And what are what are some of the things that are coming out of What's happening in Italy that sort of debunk a lot of these other uh, rumors and false facts that are coming out about Corona? Well, it's gonna, it's coming here as well. It, it's several things. With the, uh, the first case that actually was uh, reported here in Sonoma, which is where I am, which is roughly an, an hour and a half north of San Francisco, was it was actually a healthcare worker 
uh, around our age that was the, one of the first people who caught the virus. And and just before going on live with you, I uh, I was reading the New York Times and the first uh, a, a newborn child, a, a young infant, has died in in Illinois uh, today. So I, all those myths and all those generalizations about what the virus what virus is and how it moves across the population is it's not something that people really have a grip at and i think that the level of disconcern about this is is, is going to have a very hard consequence now because in italy we see a lot more people uh, spread demographically uh, catching the virus and, and and young people as well you know who maybe have pre maybe have pre-existing issues with you know respiratory problems or asthma such as as myself and, and I think a lot of people are starting to worry and realizing that it's not just something that affects only older people. And which I also, it, I'm a little bit taken back by that because it's very important that everyone, regardless of their age, are taken good care of in society. And this, I find it uh, impossible to accept that just because you're old, you, 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 there's no life is dispensable in that sense. And we have to, you know, you should also measure a country very directly as to how they take care of the elderly. And, and Italy has always taken such great care of the elderly. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to live in a country that, that would have it any other way, to be honest. Um, are people getting the message now in America? Because we're sort of struggling back here in Australia with, you know, beaches still being used. Uh, people aren't practicing um, social distancing. Given the seriousness of the nature in America, are they getting the message or are they still flaunting the rules? I think they are now. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I can only see for how it's been for me. I mean, uh, a few weeks ago, I was dropping off one of our rent trucks for for tire service, and I was given a, a loaner car uh, at the at the car dealer, you know, where they were sorting out the the rent truck, and they were laughing at me for manically disinfecting the loaner car and, and wiping down everything from the, you know, from from the doorknob uh, or or the keys to the to the car. And but I know that now I see also, I, I, you know, we still have people here at the ranch. I had a I had the pest control trying to figure out a termite situation in, in the house I'm currently living. You know, I, it's, it's very much in the rural countryside where I am, and and people understand it now. They really keep distance, and you know, meetings are cancelled, and and you know, we we run a, a winery, and a lot of that is farm work, uh, especially at the moment. We're, you know, with, um, where we are in the growing season, and, and luckily because of that category of industry we're in, we're allowed to work. But it's it's, it's obviously mandatory that everyone keeps their distance and everyone's follow following the rules. Uh, that's one of the you know it, it 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 wouldn't be possible really to do anything if people were were not taking that seriously and that's why also why coming back to what we spoke about before i'm finding it absurd to even entertain the idea that one thing if bike races they are relevant and they mean a lot to me and they mean a lot to people who are into cycling but i also find it a little bit uh Lacking sense of reality to to even discuss at this moment in time whether whether the tour should be run or not, and 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 sometimes I find that it's a little bit thick headed of the the, the ASO to to just to insist on this and and it's nice that they keep the hope alive but realistically I'm, I'm, I'm I just really can't really imagine that to happen especially now that the Olympics have been uh, postponed. So you're telling me we shouldn't have opened the show with that chat? We should have pushed it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's the right. So you know. Uh, the love for, for the tour and the love for cycling is something that you and I have in common. And I think, you know, you do something, uh, you're in another place in your, in your life right now. And, and, and I, I am as well. And I'm, but it, I, I would always, even with the time dif difference or anything, and, and I'm sure you would as well, you'd be watching the tour, uh, yeah. uh, even in a, in a, in, in an altered version, which they're, they're talking about right now. And I, and I, I wouldn't miss it if it wasn't going to happen, but I would also be, extremely outraged if, if they did and it, it was uh, held under circumstances that weren't safe and weren't secure and just th the idea of them riding whilst you know a, a, an entire french population is struggling to try and overcome the curve of a virus and they're out in the landscape uh, in, in the peloton pretending that that everything is normal i, I find mm -hmm. that a little bit uh, it's a strange kind of fantasy to be honest now, how are you handling uh, confinement? Obviously, you're lucky you're not in a, a small little apartment in uh, Italy, which a lot of people are and across the world. Uh, how are you traveling uh, with the whole lockdown? Because essentially, you're, you're being treated like all of us as corporate criminals. You just don't have the uh, ankle bracelet. Yeah. Um, I used to live alone for many years when I worked in cycling and I used to live alone actually on uh, on top of a hill in Tuscany, and so the the isolation part I, I can easily deal with, you know. And I'm, uh, I'm lucky to have I I traveled over here with my beloved cat, so he's uh, he's keeping me. Uh, oh, is that, keeping is me that the famous fruit bat cat? The one of yeah, the fly. 
yeah so i have my cat and that definitely helps the one thing that i will never get used to and that that definitely is uh, is hard at any time of day is that i i, I miss my kids terribly and i, I really miss yeah. my wife and i you know it's it's uh I'm, it's, it'll be seven weeks that i haven't seen them uh, as of monday and 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 you know one thing is isolation but and I, i'm selfishly I, I can't really say that that anyone should be concerned about that because they're healthy and i'm and i'm and i'm healthy but it'd be strange if i wasn't missing them all the time and how, how are they coping back in uh denmark you said your uh your in-laws place could be any fuller or whatever but have, have they got a sort of support network around them that they can help through a period like this yeah i we we really f- we were lucky to get out of italy in, in time and to have sort of dodged what what eventually turned out to be a very serious situation there and you know with, with two newborns you wouldn't want to be running in and out of hospital as, as you often have to because there's always something when you have a, a small child so yeah they, they they're good they're traveling well you know I've been, as the technology we're using right now it makes it possible for me to to see them uh, quite often and then you know when my, my wife is is awake at very odd hours uh, during the <laughs> during night or day because she's she's up with with the kids you know i uh, I know that you have two, but you had them at least separately. And I, I wouldn't if people with one kid. I, I wonder what they do with all the time they have on their hands because two kids is definitely a challenge. And I'm hopefully soon to find out uh, a lot more specifically myself. That's what I've really struggled with: is the people that don't have kids complaining, like how boring it is. Like it is so full gas, just trying to entertain kids, particularly if you've got ones that are sort of the two and and one year olds. Um, and, and if they're taking, as a shocking. And if they're taking anything from you, Josie, it wouldn't be, it would be a handful in uh, itself. I, I've watched Frozen and Frozen 2, I reckon, at least three times a day for the past week, and uh, I'm over it. Uh, I'm, I'm about to, to lose it. Um, now, Brian, before we sort of wrap things up, um, looking into the crystal ball, what do you think is going to happen in the next six months, and what would you love to happen knowing everything that's going on at the moment? Well, above all, you know, and I'm sure we can agree on that. We we want life to return to normal, and uh, we want to see if there's something, if anything good will come out of this. Maybe our sense of community and how we organize society, and how we we try and and be a little bit better prepared in in when these situations arise. You know, you wouldn't have to go back and a very far away in, in in history to see what Bill Gates said just a few years ago about how this could be the biggest threat to to the modern civilization. Then it, it it actually turned out that way. For for cycling, if you know, we should we should come back to that small, tiny, and I guess in the larger scheme of things, a relevant corner of the world. I really want to see all my my friends and riders, staff, everyone uh, come out of this with with their job still uh, existing. I want the teams to survive, and I hope the races will will pick up again. Uh, cycling has seen some tough times, and and it's never really done anything for the. And there's always people who be passionate about cycling. The fan base is growing. A lot of people are into cycling. A lot of people love riding their bikes. So hopefully, the, as we eventually and hopefully soon come back to a more normal state of of living our lives, I hope cycling can can find its feet again. But it's, yeah, I, I worry that it's going to take its toll financially. That that's been at a standstill at at, at least to a certain degree. That one of the most important parts of the season. All right, Brian, well, I think uh, that's been a pretty insightful chat there, mate. I appreciate uh, all your time. Um, I have have, have plenty of it, John. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Are you hoping as soon as the travel restrictions are lifted, will will you head back to to Europe at all or or vice versa? Will will you just get your family to come over, depending on the um, neighbours and their, their gun situation? (laughs) <laughs> no, no. At the, I mean, there are there are weapons at a range when you have the types of animals that I mentioned before, just not at my house. No, the idea is definitely to get them out here as, as fast as possible. The, the, we want to. This is where we're going to live our lives for for the next long long period. And then I have I have a lot to do work wise, and I also you know I've, I've set up this entire situation here to be able to be close to them and, and not work in cycling, meaning having to travel all the time, either as a commentator or, or working for teams. So uh, I, I just can't wait to get started on, on what was a, maybe not normal, but as close to as, as it could be for someone like me. All right, Brian. Well, we wish you all the best, mate, and uh, we'll be checking in again soon. Thanks for joining us on the inaugural. Uh, no, that's not the right word. The opening episode. It's inaugural meets every year, doesn't it? It's great anyways, Jones, and I'm proud to be part of it. You can always count on me. 
All right, good on you, mate. I'll speak to you soon. Cheers.